。えー、ではただいまより第57回大会の招待公演、えー、アイドホームインフルスケオテクノロジーのドクターダニエル・ラッケスに、えー、先生によるトロレスリラリアブルキュムラティブサイコロジカルサイエンスを始めさせていただきたいと思います。えー、本日は多くのご参加をいただきどうもありがとうございます。えー、少しだけ私、大会準備長の方から趣旨説明をさせていただきます。えーまあ、多くの皆さんご承知の通り、えー、心理学、特に社会心理学における研究成果の,あの結果の再現性の問題というのは、えー、近年、えー、いくつかのスキャンダラスな案件も含めて、えー、大変大きな話題になっております、えー。学術的な問題のみならず、社会的な問題にもなっていると存じます。この問題が重要かつ深刻なのはいろんな側面があると思うんですが我々研究者自身の営みですねえつまり研究という行為そのものの中にともすれば無意識のうちに存在するかもしれない問題のある研究実践これが関わっている可能性があるからだと思いますでこうした問題に対する関心というのは何も今に始まったことではないんですけれどもえここ数年私どもが自覚的になってきたということも事実ではないかと思いますでえー、こうした現状をよく把握して将来の自分たちの研究に、えー、そしてそれが生み出す成果をより質の高いものにしていくためには我々はどのような取り組みをすればよいのかということについて、えー、非常に具体的な手がかりが求められているというふうに思えると、えー、考えられます。えー、今日はね、ラケス先生からは、まあ、現在のご自身の取り組みを踏まえまして、えー、数多くのこれに関連する情報をお聞かせいただけるものと期待をしております。えー、なおあの本あの、本省編はあの成立でございますが、えー、私が代表者を務めております科学研究費調整的効果研究、えー、社会心理学研究の再現可能性検証のための日本拠点構,構築の補助により行われております。えー、本日の、えー、講演のオーガナイザーをご紹介いたします。えー、お二人の会員に、えー、お願いをいたしました。えー、まず、池田さん、えー、日本学術振興会特別研究員中京大学の池田幸喜さんと、慶、え、応、ー、技術、義塾大学の平石海さんですお二人とも先ほど申し上げた私が代表者の派遣費の研究のメンバーでございますどうぞよろしくお願いいたしますドクターラケンスウェルカムトゥジャパンエンドザ15セブンサニアのミーティングをジャパニーズソサイトのソーシャルサイトをし We deeply appreciate your acceptance and invitation in coming to our conference and we are now very excited to get a chance of hearing your lecture thank you very much Okay, so I work at Korea f a m i l y Group. My first effort is to make an introduction to the h a m i l g r o u p of C and Kelly, as I heard that they were seeing already. So, it is,、uh, so, yeah. so please welcome Dr. Daniel l a g u e s Alright, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about a topic that I think is very timely and、uh, that's on quite a lot of people's minds.、Um, recently, we've started to think more about how we can do the best science that we can do. And I think we've realized that in certain instances, we can actually do a little better. There's some room for improvement. That's good. That's how science is supposed to work. There's always some room for improvement. And I'd like to share some of the Problems that I think are most important to focus on, and also talk because I don't really like to talk about problems too much. So, I really like to talk about some of the things that personally I found most helpful to deal with these issues. So, let's just talk a very little bit about the problems because it's, it is important to understand why we might need to reconsider some of our current practices. So, one of the things that we tend to do as researchers is collect some data and then we do statistical tests, and very often we will calculate a p value, so we do some statistics. And we use these p values in a little bit of a peculiar way, because if these p values are small enough, typically smaller than 0.05, we consider a finding worthwhile to be published. But if we find a p value that's higher than this, then we do a very weird thing. We don't tell anybody about all the work that we've done. We just store it somewhere.、Uh, I think we used to call this、uh, a file drawer. Nowadays, you might call it the, the Dropbox effect or something. And now we store it somewhere else. And this is problematic. And I'll just quickly highlight why it is problematic. 
So if you look at this, this is a histogram of the p-value distribution in the scientific literature. So if you take a lot of journals and a lot of articles in these journals and you look at the p-values that you find, then this is the pattern that you find. Now maybe you have very strong pattern completion skills. And if you look at this, this part here, you might say, well, that's sort of like a curve. It looks a little bit like a curve. And you might expect that this curve goes on. It goes on like this. And if you would expect this, you'd be totally right. Yes, we would expect that this curve goes on. However, we see a very weird drop here. And this is the position of the 0.05 criteria for publication. So there is something here that's supposed to be there, but it's missing. So it's like a big monster came by and took a huge bite out of the scientific literature, and it's just gone. Now, it's supposed to be there. You probably know where it is. It is somewhere in your file drawer. Right? It's somewhere in my file drawer as well. We have done these studies, but we have not shared them with other people. And this is a common practice, but it's a very problematic practice. I would say one of the most problematic things that we do. In psychology, we score, well, it depends on how you want to interpret it, but we score highest on the amount of hypotheses that actually support our prediction or are the results that support our hypothesis. So about 40 or 92% of the papers that are published show the effect that was expected. And some people have joked that this percentage is so high that we don't actually need to do the research anymore. We can just say, well, I had a great idea. I know that 92% or 94% of the findings in our literature work anyway, so let's just assume that I'm true. Now, of course, that's not true. We very often examine things that aren't true. But we don't know about these things. At the same time, we are all very smart and rational people. And we know that this cannot be the truth. Let me do very, very simple math. I'm not going to talk about statistics at all, but let's have just this one slide. So let's say we do studies with the recommended 80% statistical power. And statistical power is the probability that you'll find a significant result if it's really there. Right? So that's the statistical power. We know it's typically much lower in psychological research. But let's say that we get this 80% statistical power in every study that we do. And then you open a journal, like the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, which is considered a flagship journal in our field. And you look at a specific uh, article in this journal, and there are four studies. Okay, that's good. You need that nowadays if you want to get published in such a prestigious journal. You need a lot of studies. And we see that all these studies show a statistically significant effect. It can happen if you have 80% power, but it's not very likely. Because if you do a study, and another study, and another study, and another study, four in a row, and you have 80% power for every study, it means that the probability that all of these studies show a statistically significant effect is 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.8. It will happen in less than 50% of the four study papers that everything works out. At the same moment, if we read a journal like this, we see only significant, journal, significant studies. It's weird. Are we publishing fiction? Then it could be, right? It's perfectly fine. No, that's not what we're doing. We're trying to show something that's happening in the real world. So how can it be that we realize that you cannot find this pattern if you do real science? At the same time, the flagship journals in our field look like this. It's a peculiar situation that we allow this. Now, the consequence is pretty dire. As long as you don't share all of this data, as long as you don't share all published or all research that you've done, you cannot really be a quantitative science. And I know that as a college, we really want to be in quantitative science, right? We think that we are. But it means that you can really calculate numbers. You calculate effect sizes, and they should mean something. Uh, but in this case, if just a large part of the literature is gone, you can calculate an effect size. Like how big is an effect in our, uh, in our uh, field of study? So if we have a certain intervention, how much better are people going to get? But if we don't have all the data, then we cannot really put a number. We can calculate something, but it's not a very meaningful number. And the number might be much smaller, it could even be zero. So we really have no way of knowing this. Now, there are some initiatives in psychology that try to deal with this. For example, uh, things like Psych File Drawer. 
And this is a website where people can upload some data of studies they've done that were not statistically significant. But it's sort of an ad hoc solution to a problem. It leads to something that's quite problematic, and sometimes people find this difficult to believe, but it leads to a situation where you can have maybe 200 statistically significant studies in the published literature without there being a true effect. Do you think I'm overstating this? Do you think this could be? Sounds like a lot, right? But let's take an example, a very popular topic in social psychology, ego depletion. So this is a topic where many, many people are interested in. Now, I personally know at least maybe 50 people that study this. It's very popular in the Netherlands. So these 50 people, they've been studying this for 10 years. Now, let's say that they do four studies a year. So this means 50 people times four studies a year, that's 200, times 10 years, so that's 2,000. And there are apparently also some people in the US. It's supposed to be a pretty big place. So there are more than 50 people studying it. So all these people are doing research. Now, if you do a data analysis on a topic like this, and you find 200 studies, then I always wonder, so where's the rest? There's so many people working on this. Now, let's take a look at uh, what happens if you do this. Now, it's possible to, to detect publication bias. We cannot solve it. We cannot statistically fix the issue, but we can detect it. So this is a funnel plot. And if you do a beta analysis, then you'll see these funnels. And here, every dot is not a single individual, but it's a single study. So these are a lot of studies. They're all the form. And you can see that there are effect sizes here. And there's the standard error of an effect that's on the vertical axis. Now, this is related to the sample size. Basically, the higher up you go, the larger the sample size becomes. It also means that the larger the sample size you have, the smaller the standard error can be, and an effect can still be statistically significant. You can see it in the triangle shape here. Everything that falls within this triangle is not statistically significant, but everything that falls just outside of the triangle is. And you see a kind of peculiar pattern do you see that it looks like a lot of these dots here are just outside, just outside of this great triangle? So they're just statistically significant, but they don't look like normal science should look like. If they are completely randomly uh, drawn from the population, they should form a circle and not sort of like a skewed pattern like this. So you can see that something is going on, but we can't really know what's going on. Well, maybe a little bit. So there are some new statistical techniques that try to allow you to guess if there is a true effect in a set of studies by examining the distribution of their p-values. And this is useful. I'll show you one example later on where I talked about this topic to some students. And there was a student in the audience who had been trying to replicate an existing effect to build on it for over a year. Now, as a PhD student in the Netherlands, you have about four years to do your research. So she spent one entire year trying to replicate this, and it didn't work. And then she was in the audience and explained this e-curve analysis, which I'll briefly talk about. She quickly typed in some numbers, and I'll show you the numbers later. And then she's like, well, if I'd known this before, I would have saved myself a year. Right? Now, this e-curve analysis is a key to this file drawer. So we have this big problem of publication bias, and this is trying to solve this problem by at least letting, letting you see if something is going on or not. So if you do a lot of studies, let's say 100 studies, and there's no true effect, do you know what the p-value distribution is supposed to look like? I had no clue until maybe three years ago. No clue. Someone told me what it looks like, and I said, oh, they can't be right. But anybody knows what this looks like? So if you do 100 studies and there's no true effect, so you saw the p-curve earlier, right? The histogram of p-values, and it has this skewed this curve like that. That's when there is a true effect. When there is a true effect, you expect any small p-values, the significant ones, if there's a true effect. If there's no effect, the p-value distribution is completely uniform. Every p-value is equally like. That's how they were made. Statistics, that's the goal. Maybe it sounds a little weird, but it's a good fact to know. So you get a flat line like this. 
Now in this flat line, you see that I only have an axis here that goes to 0 0.05. Why? Because we saw earlier that beyond 0 0.05, there's this dip, there's this problem of propagation rates. But below 0 0.05, we should have access to the entire literature. So if we look, if the line is flat, it looks like there's no true effect. If we have a lot of studies with a true effect, the line should look a little bit like this. So there are many small p-values, significant p-values for a true effect. So what you can do is you can test whether the p-value distribution in a set of studies, in a field of research you're interested in, looks more like a flat line or more like the good-looking curve line. So you can do this test only on the significant p-values. You have access to everything you need. Let's take a look at some examples very quickly. Not, this is not a statistics lecture, but I want to point out a little bit what the problems are and how you can solve them as well. So there's a useful website. You can just go there. You can type in some numbers. It's very easy. You don't need to learn new statistics. You just type in some tests and statistics. This side it explains everything. So you can do this looking. Does it look like there's a true effect or not? So we test whether something is flat or whether it looks like there's a true effect. So I did this on two lines of research. And the reason I did this on these two lines of research is because there are some people that were trying to replicate these effects. Maybe you know them. They're called elderly priming or professor priming. And in both of these lines of studies, people are exposed to stimuli of a certain meaning. Either they're related to elderly, words like bingo and gray. This was done in Florida, so, uh, or in the US. And then the word Florida is also associated with elderly. So they were exposed to these kind of words, or there was a control condition, and then they had to walk through a corridor to an elevator. And the time it took them to walk to the elevator was measured. And they walked more slowly if they were primed with the elderly stereotype. So that's one line of research. People couldn't replicate it, but then other people said that's both perfectly fine. What does one replication, non-replication mean? We know that there are many studies that have shown this effect in the literature. And then you can say, is this real or not? The same for professor priming, but there people are primed with a professor. They have to think about a professor for a long time, and then they perform an intelligence test or a trivial pursuit test. And then they perform slightly better on the test if they just thought about a very smart professor. So there's these two lines of research. Now this is if you p-curve the first, the elderly priming literature. You can see the hypothetical flat line. You can see the hypothetical line if there's a true effect. And actually, in this set, this set of studies, the curve is not even flat, but it's very peculiar, pointing to there's just very many of these nearly significant p-values. Now, that's weird. It's not supposed to happen. In any case, this means that there's no true effect here. So if you're a graduate student looking for a topic to study, I would not maybe build on this. You'd probably waste it another year. In the other sense, the professor priming literature looks a little bit better. So if you want to do social private research, I would say maybe you want to build on this. The more important point is, if we just publish significant events and we don't share everything, then we won't know what's true or not, and our students cannot build on this. But most importantly, people outside of our academic field cannot build on the knowledge that we generate as well. All right, you can also even use this for small uh, findings. I always like this example because this is the real one that this uh, student has. It was published in a journal that some people think is prestigious, science. And some people might think that this is a very good journal, that all the research that ends up in science must be very good. Maybe we don't think that's good. Uh, so if you look at these uh, studies, the nice thing is that they have all these effects clearly specified in a table. And you can see 0.01 p-value, 0.08. I would say it's not statistically significant, but this is science. It's OK. They don't really care, apparently. 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04. It's a little bit weird, but it's better. And if you plot this, you can also see that it's not looking like there's really much going on. So we know that this sort of thing happens in our literature, due to publication bias and other things, and we might want to prevent it, because this might be a very good theory. It might be a really smart idea, right? But we don't have evidence for this. And we're really wasting our time with it. We should try to do a bit better. Because so tax money, very often, goes into our research. So we want to make sure that the research that comes out of it is worthwhile. All right. Now, how can we improve these kind of things? I think that's an important topic. And one of the things that we realize is most important 
is that we need to collect some bigger samples in our research. I'll talk a little bit about why this is useful. So we need to collect some more data, and I realized that yesterday there was a workshop that was apparently had a full house, was well attended, about uh, how to perform power analysis to justify your sample size. Now, if you do this, maybe you've learned, if, who was at this workshop? Were you at this workshop? Some people? Well, it's good. I can give a small summary of some of the useful aspects. But what do you do right now? How would you determine the sample size for a new study? Anybody brave enough to uh, tell me what they would do? No? Nobody brave enough to It's fine. I'll tell you what I did. So when I was a PhD student, I learned that you can just collect about 15 or 20 people in each condition of your experiment, and that's fine. Does that sound like something that you do? Yeah, just collect 15 or 20 people and that's fine. Or maybe the number is a little higher. Maybe now it's like 25. Because the number is slowly rising over the years. People realize we need larger sample size, but they're rising really, really slowly. Yeah? Some people are knowing that's good. So that's what I used to do as well. It's not a really good approach because these small samples, and 20 or 25 is very often still a very small sample, has huge variability, and especially this statistical power concept that I talked about. You have very low power, which means you do a study, and if it doesn't work, you don't really know if there's a true effect or not. It's very difficult to distinguish between these two things. Now, this is a nice paper explaining that if you have a small amount of data, in this, uh, set, this part of the graph over here, you have huge variability in the effect that you might observe. And if you collect more and more data, slowly but surely, your effect size estimate becomes more stable. So here, if you're on the left side of the graph, you can see these huge waves, huge waves. So this is sort of, if you're sailing on a sea, you're having huge waves. It's not very smooth sailing. You don't really want to be there. The authors of this paper call this part on the right, where things stabilize, the corridor of stability. At a certain moment, you, your effect size becomes quite stable. So if you have a large enough sample size, you really know what you're talking about. It sounds like something where you want to be, right? This corridor of stability. That sounds very nice. I want to be in the corridor of stability if I do research. I don't want to be on the seas of chaos, because that's sort of slightly scary. Now, I also know that if I talk to you about that we need high-powered studies, it will not have an effect on what you do. So it's a little bit, yeah, I don't know, what should I do with this? Because uh, there's research that shows this, for example. Do studies on statistical power have an effect on the power of studies? So if people are explained that they are doing underpowered research, does this actually influence that they're going to do better power research? And the answer is no. So maybe I flew all the way over here from the Netherlands to Japan, and then what I'm going to say doesn't make much of a difference. It's, uh, and the battery is low. All right, I think the battery is just a bit tired. So we need to, uh, really realize that we want to do slightly better power research. And why do we want to do this? Because it gives more information and we're more likely to get statistically significant results if there is a true effect. Now, personally, I worry about this. I think this is important. And the reason why I think this is important is because, as it turns out, when you're in my age, between 35 and 40, that's more or less the age where you do your Nobel Prize winning research. That's true. In sort of my age category. If you look at all the people who won Nobel Prizes, they do their great research when they're about 35 or 40, and that's my age. So if I would not have high-powered research, and I do a study, I have a great idea, my Nobel Prize winning idea. But I do a study, I don't find a significant result due to low power, because I didn't have a lot of participants, and I would miss out on my future Nobel Prize. So for me personally, it's very important to make sure that I have good sample sets. So what can we do about this? Well, first of all, it's important to realize we are not doing a very good job. We know that in psychology, and this has been known for this, this earliest paper by Cohen in 1962, 
already mentioned that we have about 50% statistical power. So that means that if you do the study, you might as well just flip a coin. If there is a true effect, you might as well just flip a coin. You're 50% likely to find it if it's there, but you're also, because you have such low statistical power, have a very high probability of not finding an effect, even when it is there. And this is a more recent paper by Freire and Vazile. They also come up at about 50% power. So nothing has changed in more than 50 years. But now, we see a lot of journals starting to recommend or require even that you justify your sample size because they say, okay, now we've had enough. We need to improve this practice. So it's very likely that if you want to submit something, for example, the Journal of uh, Experimental Social Psychology, that when you submit your study there, someone will ask you, so what did you do to determine your sample size? And then things like, well, I just used 20 people because that's what I always do. They won't really be good enough anymore. So it's good to think about these kind of things at this time. So don't use heuristics, any heuristic. Some people now say you need 50 participants to uh, collect uh, data, 50 participants in each condition. But that's also a heuristic. That's never really a good approach. What you want to do is try to justify the sample size based on the, what you want to achieve. So sometimes you do research and you want to show that there are statistically significant effects. That would be one way. But sometimes you want to measure something very accurately. You don't want to test something. You just want to know how big does the, uh, is the effect of uh, this better teaching strategy for young kids? How much higher is their grade, for example? So if you want to estimate, you can see that if there's just a few data points, there's a lot of uncertainty. In this case, this blue area is the confidence interval. It's a huge confidence interval. There's a lot of variation possible. But if we have more data points, we can see that we very accurately estimated the true effect size, the correlation in this sense. So that's one thing that you might want to do. Another thing is to try to, um, oh, and if you want to do that, then this is actually a great paper that I highly recommend if you never thought about planning sample size. I can highly recommend to take a look at that. Another thing to do is to justify your sample size based on the probability of observing a statistically significant effect. So here are again these p-value distributions, which I find really useful to think about. And in this case, this is the visual demonstration of what it means to have 50% statistical power. Why does this mean 50%? Well, we've simulated some studies here, 100,000. And you can see that for 50,000 of these 100,000 studies that we simulated, the p-value falls below 0.05, which is this bar. So you see that you're just as likely to have a p-value anywhere in this area. There is a true effect here. There's something to be observed. But you only have 50% power. So you might want to increase that a little bit, let's say 95% power, to so make sure that if there's a true effect, that you actually observe it. So you do power analysis. So that's another approach that you can use. So if you work at this uh, Sample size, how to determine your sample size symposium yesterday. Maybe uh, someone has videotaped it, you can take a look. But there's also some great resources online to look at these things if you want to. I'll very quickly give something that was probably not mentioned, but I find very useful in becoming more efficient. Because one thing that I worry about, if we start to recommend better practices for all of you, we say, well, now we've realized that you actually need to do higher power research that comes at a certain cost. So if you want to have higher statistical power, you have to collect larger sample sizes. And we all know that really what you like most to do in life is sit in the lab and collect even more data, right? That's not really the greatest thing to do. And it also costs a lot of time, a lot of money, right? To be in the lab, to collect data. It's very intensive. You might not have a lot of resources. So I think it's important to think about the way in which you can be most efficient in getting better power studies, but also make it feasible for researchers to do this. In these graphs, you can see the increase in statistical power as the sample size grows. So you see that it's sort of a weird curved linear pattern like this. It grows pretty quickly in the beginning, and then it sort of slows down. So let's say that you have, and all the different lines are different effect sizes. So you know that the statistical power depends on the alpha level that you use, the power that you want, the sample size that you have, and the effect size. 
So these things, the effect size and the sample size and the alpha, they together determine the statistical power. Now you're never going to change the alpha now, which is 0, 1, 0, 5, right? You would never change that. You can, but people never do, because it's sort of like a holy threshold that you don't want to mess with. You can mess with it, but okay. So let's say you keep that at a certain level, 0, 1, 0, 5, then the only thing you have to increase the physical power for a given effect is your sample size. So let's say that, do you know what the average effect size is in psychology? If you group everything together, do you have an idea of how big the effect is in the research that you do? Would you know this? If I would ask you about the size of the effect of whatever you are studying, would you know this? I think I didn't know this until a couple of years ago before I realized that this was important. But take a look. Take a look at the effect size of the research you do. Because if you study something with huge effects, you don't need to collect a lot of participants. But if you happen to study something where we know that the effect is quite small, then you collect, need to collect a lot of participants. So that's important to keep in mind. Now, the average effect size in psychology is around the red line, Cohen's D of 0 0.4. That's actually what you, if you don't know anything, that's the great average over everything. So it means that you are following this line. And if you want to reach a high power, 80%, you need to have pretty big sample sizes in each condition. And some people are not even shaking their head like, no, no, I'm not going to collect 200 participants in each between subject condition, which I can totally understand. That would be a lot. So there are two things you can do. Study something with a big effect. Or maybe there are some other ways which can be a little bit more efficient. Let's take a look. So, um, one of the things that I think are very useful is known as sequential analysis. And it's not used a lot. I'll talk a little bit about the problem, what we do, which is not correct, but basically the incorrect way to do this is take a look at the data a couple of times. Let's say you collect data for five days in the lab. You take a look at the data after every day. Now, that sounds like a great idea, because when the effect is statistically significant, you can stop. And that's it's very efficient. Someone else can go into the lab after you. You don't need to collect more people. So the idea is very good. It is very efficient. But you cannot just do it without correcting for these molecules. But correcting for it is very easy. So let's take a look. So the bad way of doing it is called optional stopping. So you collect data, you look at the data, and you stop. A lot of people did this. And if you think back about this p-value distribution for elderly crime, do you remember that it was not just flat, but it went a little bit in a weird direction? Now, if we simulate a lot of studies with this optional stopping strategy, first of all, the good practical advice is, if you do this, you can always get a statistically significant result, even if there's no true effect. You can take that, effect, that advice as good advice or as something that you should not do, but it is a reality. So if we look at the data often enough, even if there's no true effect, you always find a significant result at a certain moment. It looks like this. So this is the p-value distribution. If I've looked at the data multiple times, but I stop whenever it's statistically significant. It looks a bit weird, but this better. Because we now know that if there was no effect, and here there is no true effect, we should find a flat line. But it looks like somebody has been scraping off some of these p-values here and scraped them just below the 0 0.05 threshold. Do you see this? There's some missing here. And they've been scraped to statistical significance. The pattern also looks very weird. You see that the p-values are actually, it's more likely to find a p-value of 0 0.04 than it is to find one of 0 0.01. So 0 0.04 is this bar. It's more likely than finding a smaller p-value. So this only happens if you don't do statistics correctly. And we can now identify when people have done this. Um, so it's not a very smart thing to do anymore. I would not recommend doing this in your line of research. But how can we do it right? Because I said before, I don't want to complain. I don't want to just point fingers and say, oh, people made a mistake. Everybody, most of the people I talked to about this, myself included, have no, had no idea that this was problematic. We thought this was a very efficient thing to do. But it is problematic. But luckily, the fix is also very easy. 
So you can do this sequential analysis, and they do this in some areas, such as medicine, for example. It's very common in medicine to look at the data multiple times, but then do it the right way. They do it for two reasons. First of all, they do it because it's very efficient. And these are from pharmacological or pharmaceutical companies. And you know that they are all about making money, as much money as quickly as possible. Maybe they're also a bit about helping people, that's great. But they want to make money as efficiently as possible. They use this because it is very efficient. And it's also very easy to use. So this is a paper, and you don't have to read this, but I'll quickly explain. So this is the introduction of sequential analysis as a tool, as a statistical tool. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this because I have to bring up the war very quickly. But, I mean, it's a long time ago. Oh, you know, we're, we're past it. But, um, this is uh, written by an American uh, researcher. And he published this, or wanted to publish this, in 1943. This is the sequential analysis test that they use, for example, to test ammunition. And you can realize that if you want to test whether ammunition works or not, the only way to test whether the factory is producing good ammunition is to fire the ammunition. So every time you fire, you lose the ammunition. So you want to be a bit efficient while you do this. And here, let me just briefly read it to you. He says, because of the substantial savings in the expected number of observations affected by the sequential probability ratio test, and because of the simplicity, so he's saying it's crazy effective, and it's really easy to do, the National Defense Research Committee considered these developments sufficiently useful for the war effort to make it desirable to keep the results out of reach of the enemy. So this was really useful, very efficient. And during wartime, I think, if you think about statistics, I always think it's a little bit boring. A little bit boring. But apparently, this was cool enough to keep it out of hands of the enemy. Um, now, this was hidden away during the war effort, and that's why he published it in 1945, after the war. And now we don't use this as psychologists. I think that's kind of weird. So how does it work? Very quickly, just to give you one example of how we can solve some of the problems while still being more efficient, or as efficient as possible. First of all, what you need to know is that now we're used to spending our alpha level, so our type 1 error rate, probability that we find an effect if there's nothing. We spend it by looking at the data once. But here you can spend it any way you want, over a number of looks at your data. So you can have different strategies, and it's a little bit like going out drinking. If you go out drinking, there are some people who like to get drunk really early in the morning, so they drink a lot in the beginning, and they don't drink as much at the end. There are also some people who are starting very slowly, they don't drink a lot, but then at the end of the evening, they spend, you know, you can do it any way you like. I'm going to talk really quickly about this, the bulk box spending function, because it's so easy to understand. So you can just go to Wikipedia and find these alpha levels. And it's a little bit like the Bolferoni correction. Do you know the Bolferoni correction? If you look at the data multiple times, have you heard about this? You cannot just look at the data 10 times or 20 times, or you have to correct your alpha level. And you do it by dividing the alpha level by the number of tests that you do. So if you look at the data five times, and your alpha is 0 0.05, your both are only correct, alpha is 0 0.01. And if you do this, you can look at five different tests, but you won't increase your false positive rate. Here, you see that if you look five times at the same data as it's coming in, your alpha level is very close to 0 0.01, but actually a little bit higher. It's a little bit higher for technical reasons, but it's even more beneficial than a bulk film correction. Now, this means you can look at the data a number of times. Why is this easy? Because remember these power curves that went like this? So they, they increase pretty much in the beginning, but then they sort of slowly, slowly grow afterwards. It means that you have quite a lot, a high probability of finding an effect if it's there in the beginning. So if you just look there once, 50% of the time, maybe, you can already stop the data collection the right way. But if it's not significant, you can collect some more data and look at it again. Now, I think what's important, and you see a lot of these new techniques, I don't know if you ever heard about this. It's fine if you didn't. You don't have to read all my scientific articles. You know, it would be nice, but no, I'm just joking. If you want to know more about this, you can read about it. But also this P-curve analysis. If you, did you, somebody hear about this already? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's very important to 
take a look at these things. First of all, it's kind of funny that psychologists themselves, I and mean, I'm not a statistician, it's a little bit weird that I'm talking about how we can improve things. I'll talk about most of these related things later on. It's kind of weird that we're talking about how to improve things, and we're figuring this out. And it's not the statistician who's figuring these things out. And it basically means that we are now having these problems, but we, together, we are trying to solve this. It's kind of weird, but also kind of positive. I like this. That people are looking at our own discipline and coming up with better ways to do research. The speaker of analysis was also invented by a psychologist, by Uri Simonson, who studies decision making. He's not a statistician. So we can figure better ways, figure out better ways to do these things ourselves and then apply them in research. And the most important thing is if we do this, we become much more efficient. So if we don't have a lot of money or research resources, then what you want to do is first take a look at the literature. We know that there's publication bias. We know we cannot trust everything just as, because it's published. Regrettably, in the end, I'll talk a little bit about how we might solve that. It's a real challenge. But what we can at least do is take a look at the findings in a slightly more critical way. And you can save yourself a lot of time by not building on certain things that are not very reliable. And you can build on things that are slightly more reliable. So if we want the cumulative science, we want to be able to build on things efficiently then these are techniques that we want to think about of introducing in our workflow. It's perfectly fine if you don't do this. Perfectly fine. I feel it is a little bit of an ethical obligation of myself to come over here and tell you how you can be more efficient. But if you don't want to do that, it's perfectly fine. Science is quite a competitive world. There are only so many professor positions. So if you don't do this and I publish more than you, that's fine. But, but if you want to be efficient, then I highly recommend thinking about introducing some of these things. There are some other ways to improve the probability that you'll find something in your next study. Let me just, maybe, yeah, why, why not? I mean, it's a little bit tricky, but let's do a little bit of mathematics, because it's Friday afternoon and you have to earn the drinks and the dinner that you get later. So let's say you do your next study, your next experiment. You don't know if there's a true effect or not. You don't know, because if you knew, you didn't have to do the study. You're not going to do a Stroop effect or something. We know that's there. So you don't know if there's a true effect or not. Let's give it 50-50 probability, OK? You have no, no idea. It could be there. It could be not there, 50-50. You set your alpha at 0 0.05, because everybody does that. And you aim for the recommended 80% statistical power, because that's recommended. And you match this perfectly. So this is a perfect study, right? Do you agree? I'm not fooling you somewhere, right? This is like a good study. So what's the most likely outcome of this study? Now, to calculate that, you have to do some math. It's not very difficult, but let's go through it. What's the probability of finding a true effect if it's really there? We can calculate this. You have 80% power, and there is a 50% probability that there is a true effect. So it's 80% times 50%. That's 40%. Yeah? There are four possibilities. You can find a false positive, a false negative, a true effect, and a, the absence of an effect because there is no effect. So that's 40%. Now let's do the same math for finding no significant effect when there is no significant effect. 50% times 100% minus the alpha, the 5%, that's 95%. So 50% times 95% is 47.5%. Now this is a bit math, okay, right? But it means that it's more likely in this ideal situation that you will not find a statistically significant effect because there is none, right? So that's important to realize the next time you do a study. If you think about these things, you can save yourself some time. How can you improve this probability? Studying things that are more likely to be true. Have a good theory, for example, right? All right, but you can also do some other things to increase the power, decrease measurement error, and validated measures. Sometimes I used to sit in my office and then it was an experiment that had to run next Monday. And we were still thinking about the dependent variables. And we just made them up at the spot. Why don't we ask people how they feel? But if you use a validated measure, you have much less measurement error. So it's much better. 
if it's possible, you can use within designs. It's not always possible, but if it's possible, it will make you much more efficient. You can increase the variability in the answer scores. If there's not a lot of wiggle room, people are not going to give a slightly higher answer. So if you use a scale with three or five answer options, people have to say, how much do you like this lecture of Dr. Blackman's at this moment? They're like, well, I'm thinking between a two and a three, but there's not a lot of wiggle room there. But if you have a larger scale, there's more room to give a different answer. You can also do that. And one that's my favorite is to use a one-sided test. Now this situation of a one-sided test is the perfect problem in our field with doing statistics. Why would you do a one-sided test? Well, because it's more efficient. If you look at the power curve, this is for an effect size of 0 0.5, either a two-sided test or a one-sided test. If you want to get 80% power for a one-sided test, you need about 28 people or 26. For a two-sided test, you need more people. Now, what are you going to do by default? Most people do by default a two-sided test because everybody does a two-sided test. That's the reason. Because people think that you're a little bit weird. Why do we do a one-sided test? When, when do you do a one-sided test? when it was not statistically significant, but when you say it's a one-sided test, it falls below 0 0.05. That's when we do a one-sided test nowadays, right? But if you would really do a one-sided test, it's more efficient. If you have a directional prediction, you can do this. I find this interesting, because if you always do two-sided tests, but you actually write down a directional hypothesis, a real statistician would tell you that you're doing a bit of a funny thing. They would say, why are you doing this? And then the only justification that you can actually give is because everybody else is doing it. Now, that's a weird justification for a scientist, right? It's, it's logical, but it's not a very good justification. Now, one way to fix some of these issues, if you want to do a one-sided test without looking like you are fooling everyone else, right? Because that's problematic. If you do a one-sided test, other people might say, yeah, you're just doing it because. So one way to erase that doubt is to write down very quickly, briefly, before you do new research, I'm going to do a one-sided t-test. And then you, you could have done this pre-registration all days. Do you know how people could pre-register something 50 years ago? They would uh, put a message in an envelope, seal the envelope, send it through signed mail to someone else, and then it's uh, signed, the date is stamped by the postal office. And then whenever the need for proof is there, you can go to this person and say, you can go there, open the envelope, and it's there. Luckily, nowadays, we have technological situations that can solve this as well. So there, for example, in medicine, there's this database, known as old trials, where people can pre-register their prediction. They can write a Word document and upload it to the internet. Now, the first time that you do this, you have to learn how to do it. It's not very difficult, but it will take you some time, maybe two days, to figure everything out. You can write down a very short summary of, okay, I'm going to do this test. So that's two days. But then you can do a one-sided test, and you can write down sequential analysis, and you can use both these techniques. They will make you much more efficient. And then after one, two, three times, you know how to pre-register. We do it in our lab. We do it in our department. Um, and after a while, you have it done in an hour, hour and a half or something. If you build on the same research, you have the same sort of templates and so on. So. And it makes you much more efficient. Our department actually requires that when it's possible, people do sequential analysis. Because it saves money from our department. We can just do math, so we can calculate that we'll save more money if people do this. You don't have to do it, but you can think about it. Another nice thing about pre-registration, if you don't know this, there are some journals that have um, what's known as a pre-registered report. Now what you do here, and I would really recommend this if you're a PhD student, and you're going to do a really difficult study that takes a lot of effort. Now you might want to publish this study regardless of whether the outcome is statistically significant or not. 
You just want to have a publication, right? That would be nice for all the effort you put in this stuff. And this journal, especially the one on the left, is very relevant for social psychology. You can send your ID, your pre-registered ID, with a theoretical justification, why is this interesting, to the editors. And they will send it out for a review. And then you get reviews from experts in the field. This sounds a bit weird, right? You are going to do your research, and then some experts in the field are going to look at your research before you've done it and give you expert feedback for free. It's pretty nice. Not only that, after they've given you expert feedback and they say, well, you have to make this small adjustment. All right, that happens, right? It almost always happens. When I publish something and I get reviews, they always say, oh, this is a very nice study. If only you had also done this. Well, what do I have to do? I have to go back to the lab, collect another study. But in this case, you haven't collected any data. So they say, make this small change. All right, you can make the change before you did all the effort. And then they will say, if you follow this plan, we will publish it regardless of whether it's statistically significant or not. But it's very efficient for you, but it's also great to prevent publication bias. So if you want to be a quantitative science and have all the results out there, you are guaranteed that they will like it because you had a great idea, not because you had a p-value that was low. I think that's a really nice thing. Now, you don't want to do this maybe for every study. That's fine. But especially for things that take a lot of effort. If you do an intervention study in a school or in a, you do a very elaborate kind of uh, experiment with experimenters and people have to work in groups, and it's a lot of effort. Now you're guaranteed that it will be worthwhile. So you can use this to share non-significant results, both for novel, but also for replication studies. And these are also important because we've seen that if you do this optional stopping, you're very likely to get a statistically significant result if there's nothing. And we know that certain fields or certain research areas have a lot of these findings that are just not true. Now this, these um, findings, if you can never publish a replication of them that shows that there's no effect, then we have no way of learning about this. But these journals will also allow you to do a replication of existing, which is very important. It's not always well rewarded in psychology, but it's very important that we do them. And if you do them, they should definitely be published, regardless of the outcome. So you can also do that here. Now we're talking about sharing a lot of stuff. And um, I think that's something that technology enables us to do. If you wanted to share your data a thousand years ago, you had to get some pretty big tablets, hack everything in there. And then how are you going to share this? But now we have digital data, almost always, not always, but almost always. And you can just share this. You can not only share your data, which is great, but you can also share things like your analysis code. Have you ever done this? Share the code, so you have your data and the code, and you share everything for the entire world to see. It's really scary the first time you do it. When I started doing this, I started to double check everything that I did. And now I think, why didn't I double check everything before I made it publicly available? It's a good practice. So you can share all your materials as well. It's another thing, you don't have to. But take a moment to think about how science would be organized if we would all do this by default. You have to invest a little bit, but after a while, everything is available for download. If you see interesting research, you don't have to create new pictures, for example, of emotional faces. You can use everything that people already have used. It will make stuff much more efficient. If you want to redo the experiment, the program to do the experiment is online as well. So it will make psychology as a whole much more efficient. Of course, people have to first invest a little and share before we have this database. But for the collective interest, it would be really interesting. There are some people, uh, myself included, who say, well, how can we stimulate this? We're just going to ask people to justify why they did not do it. So if we review something, we'll say, um, why didn't you share anything? Can you justify? Or if you cannot justify this, maybe you want to share it. It's a very small question, but it matters. We see that very small things like this can increase the probability that people share data. Now, in this graph, we're looking at 
the amount of time that people share open data, so they make their data available with their publication. Now, it's not required yet, but we see a trend that, for example, the EU, the European Union, when they fund scientific research, they now slowly start to have this as a default expectation. The ideas you are paid by tax money, the data is not yours. The data is the taxpayers. So it should be available after the research is done. Now this is on all the research where there are no such requirements. And this is for the journal Psychological Science. And this is over time. They didn't have this small intervention. And this small intervention is just you get a sticker on your article. Well, it's like a digital sticker. You know, when you were in kindergarten, you did a very good job. You get a sticker. Well, um, it's sort of like that as well. So you get a sticker on the front of your article next to the title, below the title somewhere. This is an article that shares open data. And weirdly enough, just having this small sticker there, here it was introduced, and here, and now we're, this is the second half of 2015, we're already at a percentage of almost 40% of articles in this journal that are sharing their data, making it available. If you want to use it for something else, a question you have, you can find 40% with such a small intervention. And that's very cool. We see people reuse data. They can say, hey, I have a very important question that I want to answer, and I can actually use your data for it. How great. Again, something that makes science much more efficient in the long run if you start to do these kind of things. So this is something you also might want to consider. It's not going to be in your immediate self-interest, but in the long run, it will make our field much more efficient as well. Some other uh, final tip. So if you did not share your article itself in this open science movement that I'm talking about, one of the things you can do is share your article. So if you've published something, can I access all your articles even without being within the university? Are they online somewhere? Can I read them? If I cannot, then you're not doing yourself a favor. The reason for this is that we are all pretty lazy. That's understandable. It's a good human trait. So when we search the literature, what do we do? Well, we Google. I mean, our librarians think that we should use the specific search engines of the library, but we're lazy. So we just go to Google Scholar and we type something in. And then there's a link next to some papers that says PDF available. And then we click on these links because it's easy. And these papers end up being cited more than papers that are not publicly accessible. So it's in your own interest if you want your paper to be cited a little more, to make it available. Now you might say, but I did not pay for open access. Don't worry. There are two ways to make a paper open access. One, referred to as gold open access, is if the author pays money. And then you can publish it and everybody can access it. The other way is called green open access. You cannot share the nice layout version, but you can just share your Word document that is exactly the same as the final version that went through the printer. So this is known as green open access. If you have not shared all your data, I would highly recommend that before you go for drinks, <laughs> you do it. Maybe uh, next Monday is also fun. And you want to go to this website, Sherpa Romeo. You can type in an article title, like the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. So I published there, for example. And then the website tells me, this is the small print, that it says you can upload the preprint and the postprint. The postprint is after peer review, so it's the final version as it goes to the printer. It also says you cannot upload the nice layout version. Okay, but that's fine. As long as I can read what you've done, that's most important to me. And I'm lazy. I'm doing this because I'm lazy. But there are a lot of people, academics all over the world, in much poorer countries where they cannot afford this literature, which is really expensive. They cannot afford this, so they can actually not access your article unless you do this. So this is one of those situations where it's good for you now, because your article will be cited more. It's also good for the collective. Right? So many of these things that I've been talking about are a little bit of a social dilemma. And as social psychologists, we should be able to understand these things, the conflict that exists. So there is the pro-self choice. I'm not sharing anything. I am file drawing everything that didn't work out because it makes me look like I do studies that don't work. 
and also this practice of p-hacking. So I do whatever it takes to find a statistically significant result. But for science, that doesn't lead to an optimal result. In the end, if we want a reliable and cumulative science, we need to make sure that we end up here, in the pro-social. That I'm pro-social, you're pro-social, and we're trying to collaborate on these topics to make sure that we do better research. That's all. Thanks. From the floor. Okay, first, uh, thank you very much for this talk. It's extremely useful, and I can't wait to read more about your work. So, I've been noticing a problem. I don't know if it's a problem, and I think you might be able to give me some insight. With a lot of studies being what I would say are overpowered. Where they collect massive sample sizes and you have tiny effects, but they're significant and they're getting published. And have you done any work on like looking at that, like graphing it or seeing like, that problem? Or mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? So I think that's a good question. So as as we're thinking about how to improve the way we work, what you want to prevent is extremes in either side. Now, that's why it's important for us to think about these topics ourselves, because the statistician would say, what's the problem? You have the biggest amount of data you could get your hands on, good for you. And that's not how we as researchers should think about these things. So we should think, is this worthwhile? Is this an effect size that's still relevant for the theory that we have, for example? And we should also think, is it more uh, efficient as researchers to do two studies with this sample size. We can ask two questions. Or do I want to really know the answer for this one thing to a degree of specificity that warrants this huge sample, right? So these are important questions. Now, as a practical answer, what you're saying is sometimes you see an effect size that's so tiny that it doesn't matter, right? My favorite example of this is actually from research that was done at Facebook. So Facebook has access to a huge amount of data, and they, they try to play with things that they do, of course. So they had a study in which they withheld some positive information that your friends were sharing, or they withheld some negative information that your friends were sharing. So you just see, for example, yesterday evening I posted this picture on my Facebook about Nara, the city nearby. It's such a beautiful, wonderful city. Now, if you're in the experimental condition, someone would have removed that positive post. And what they found was that the people that typed something on Facebook were influenced by this manipulation. So if you did not see my positive Nana post, you were more, less likely to say, oh, it's such a nice weather too. And people were a bit upset about this because uh, some people, my favorite comment online was basically Facebook is playing with our emotions. We know, we know that emotions are related to suicide. So basically, Facebook was making people commit more suicide. That's a bold statement. And then if you look at the effect size, it was a Cohen's D of 0 0.001, which is about the size of how much my hair grows in a day or something. You're not going to notice this. No individual notices. Now, what you might want to do is, if I have a theory about emotional contagion, I want to specify an effect size that matters. Now, I don't want to lecture too much on statistics, but if you're interested in that topic specifically, I have a blog that tries to answer these kind of questions, and there's a technique that's known as equivalence testing. Instead of saying this differs, there's a difference, and the difference is not zero, you can test is there an effect that's so small that I don't really find it worthwhile? So it's sort of reversing the normal hypothesis test. It's called equivalence testing. Again, it's very often done in medicine, where they very often want to say, is this drug as good as the drug that people are using now? Because my drug is cheaper. So they want to have a test where they can say the difference between these drugs doesn't really matter. So that's basically what you would need in these situations as well. And you can power for that. And it's very good because I'm talking about statistics, but basically what you are asking is a theoretical question. 
what kind of effects does my theory predict? And I think that's good. If you start to think about statistics a little better, you'll ask better theoretical questions, and we can also use better tests to answer these theoretical questions. Very good question. So that's an interesting question. So people often talk about the negative consequences of looking at data multiple times. Because what you do, you get these weird uh, significant results when there's nothing. Now, you have to think that there's two realities, two possible realities. Either you're examining a true effect, there is a true effect, or you're examining a situation where there's no true effect. Now, if you do all these bad things, or well, bad things, but look at the data multiple times in different ways, when there is a true effect, well, there's no real problem, because you're just more likely to find this true effect. So that sounds like it's good. And for example, if you would do the research on the Stroop effect, well, we basically know it's real, so it's okay. The problem is that if you do this, and you are in the alternative reality, then you don't really know that you're in this alternative reality because you're looking at it multiple ways and you might find something. So the problem, the risk, is that you're fooling yourself. And one of my favorite quotes by Richard Feynman is, um, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> well, uh, I think it's sort of like, uh, as scientists, our job is not to fool ourselves and we are the easiest person to fool. So it's very risky to do these things because you will fool yourself. And you're so easy to fool yourself, right? So easy. So it is giving you actually more power, but because you don't know when it's okay to use it, you have to follow the stricter rules because otherwise you get into problems. Yes. It would be nice if we could use it, but no. It's not possible. Do you understand? Yeah. But the other, I mean, so when there but you can look at data multiple times when doing the right thing, when controlling your error rate. So the sequential analysis I talked about is giving you this, right? It keeps the control okay when there is no effect, but it makes you more efficient when there is an effect. So it's one of those nice situations where it works in your favor. But uh, there's also this expression, don't, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. You know this expression? It means that you can do things in the perfect way, but that's also sometimes very difficult, and it shouldn't get you away from doing the good thing. So we're not doing double blind analysis, because then we would have to have two team members that analyze this data. I think it's a great idea if you want to do it. I mean, I would applaud people who do it. It's very good. But I think we are taking one step at a time. I could imagine that in five years, you come and visit my university, and you say, well, research has shown that if people do this sequential analysis that this Lakens guy talked about in 2014, well, now we know that people still tend to fool themselves a little bit. And what we need is double blindness. And then maybe in a couple of years, we'll say, yes, yes. But now, we are very happy with just being able to look at the data multiple times, especially because we very often have no idea about whether there is an effect or not. So power analysis is very difficult because you have to specify an effect size. And very often, uh, our ethical committee will say, well, if you have no clue, just collect data, look at it a number of times, and if it's, yeah, so. But it's a very good suggestion if you want to introduce things. If you, did you ever do something like that? No, no. Um, it would be very interesting to see people try. I think we are developing best practices. This is definitely a very good practice. And 
you think we can see in medicine, they do this, right? In medicine, in physics, they do this as well. The CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, they have blind testing. I think it's a matter of time before we learn from these fields that there are benefits of doing this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I heard if it's for um, the I think you don't need to double blind test. Yes, yes. That's a very good point. So if you pre-register, you're not giving yourself enough flexibility to worry about bias because everything is already in there. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's one way to solve it. Yeah. I think um, so, yeah, no, that's basically a, a good option. exactly the same already. And that happens sometimes when people share ideas and it's sent to a review and they can say, well, actually, I mean, my, I hear some, I'm not an editor on, in this journal, so I'm, I'm recommending it because I think it's really good, but they've really tried. And sometimes you, you hear something what they've done and sometimes someone says, so um, we already tried this. And of course they didn't publish it because it was a non-significant result. And then you can get a good discussion, so how exactly what you do, can we try to do that? In general, I would say the benefits of pre-registration in this type of information outweigh the risks because I don't see people risking their reputation stealing the research. But maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think there are pretty good check, uh, checks in place. But thank you, it's a very important point. Very much for your round of talk. Uh, I'm just curious, you have done similar type of lecture, similar type of talks in many different countries. Uh, I'm just curious, do you see any type of 
differences in uh, reactions or reactants or whatever uh, when you give a talk in Canada, United States, or in Europe, if you share that kind of experience, that would be great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I can give you uh, good insights in the Netherlands, but you're right. I've given a talk, this kind of talks, as I've been developing. I mean, the talk is never the same because every couple of months I learn something else. Where I'm like, oh, this is also very important, right? So I typically talk about things that I've just thought about. Really um, but I talk to a lot of young students as well. I give workshops. For example, there will be one in Tokyo on uh, Thursday, um, and. One interesting cultural observation is that in the Netherlands, people are extremely open to this. And the reason is very clear, because we've had a number of very big fraud cases. Now, scientific fraud is something completely different than doing the right thing in terms of building a good community of science. But interestingly enough, you apparently need the logic, like, okay, this makes sense and the emotional feeling to really do something. And the fraud cases, although it's completely unrelated to these things, have given people in the Netherlands a very big emotional feeling like, okay, we need to do something, right? So the ratio, the, the ratio, the mind, and the feeling comes together in the Netherlands. And many people think, okay, we really need to do something. So I think that combination is pretty rare because both of these things happened around the same time. And a lot of people know, for example, Dirk Stapel. I don't know if you know his name, but he, he has about 56 retractions of uh, scientific articles. But the Netherlands is small, a small unit. Maybe it's somewhere here, I don't know. But when I go to the Dutch equivalent of this meeting, we all know each other. And everybody knows someone like Dirk Stapel. Or at least you're very good friends or colleagues with one of his PhD students. So it, it sort of, everybody was sort of uh, hit by it. And then everything comes together. So that's pretty strong. Now, there are some places where there is uh, not very strong feeling to deal with an issue like this. Uh, people are like, well, what's the real problem? It's OK. Now, personally, I started to think about these things most when someone sent me an email. And his name is Greg Francis. And he's a researcher. And he published multiple papers where he points out in specific articles that the data, as he says it, are too good to be true. And it sounds like we committed to scientific frauds, but that's not the case. But we left out studies that were not significant. Exactly like I talked about in the beginning. If you have low power, and you do one, two, three, four studies, you should find non-significant effects. And we had a four-study paper in psychological science, and he wrote an email and said, it's very unlikely, he didn't say it's impossible, it's never impossible, he said it's very unlikely that you don't have an extra study somewhere or did something else. And we emailed him, we said yes, there was a fifth study, it didn't work, uh, but we couldn't publish it. But when I got that email, I was really worried. I was very uncertain, very uncertain, and my collaborators also. We didn't understand this. We had never sat down and took the effort to think about what does this mean, really? So we really were very uncertain. And then we had to respond. So we had to think about this topic. And we read about it, and then I thought, well, this is really important that I understand this. How can I do good science if I don't understand some of these basic things? And I, I, my colleagues stopped. They were like, well, then you, you tell us what is important. But I kept thinking and reading. And so I think you need some of that personal, that emotion, emotion. You need a little bit of that emotion. So what I see is that it's not a big cultural thing. In the Netherlands, is an exception. I think it's a cultural thing. And outside, it's really, does it affect you personally? If you, uh, I didn't talk about these registered replication reports, but maybe you've heard about them. When 20 labs get together, and they all do one study. Well, there was one on ego depletion. And 20 labs did a paradigm that was in uh, before they collected the data. It was reviewed by this pre-registered report for it. Experts in the field said, yes, if you do this, it should work. 20 labs, huge amount of data, no effect, nothing. Well, if that's your research area, you will start to think about these topics after such a, a replication. Right? So I think that's really the difference. More individual thing, does it hit you personally? In my experience, 
And that was really what got me thinking about it. And I'm very happy that it happened. And so some people might say, yeah, but you're personally criticized by this person. Yeah, that was my first response. And then I took some time, and after two months, I thought, yeah, it's important. We still have 10 minutes, so. Any clarification or doubts? Because <laughs> okay, so I have one question. Um, some people are saying that, for instance, the, uh, okay, so in that register uh, location reverse, uh, replication rate of the Cognitive psychology is a little bit higher than social psychology. And some people may claim that uh, social psychology might have a weaker theory. And that's because, uh, uh, yeah, that's a reason that, that might be a reason of the whole group versus the group. Yeah, so, so there was this very big project where a hundred studies from three journals in psychology were read. And there, it was different from the ego depletion one, where one study was replicated by 20 people. But there, there were 100 studies, different studies replicated by 100 different methods. And there, indeed, one of the findings, well, overall the finding was that the replication rate was pretty low. Um, but one of the small differences was that it was slightly lower for psychology, for social psychology, than for cognitive psychology. First of all, it was a tiny difference. People are overreacting. I mean, some co-author on this paper, I should say, but the difference is very small. It's not crystal clear. It looks like there's a small difference, but not enough to keep me awake at night, personally. And if it is there, then the most likely reason would probably be statistical power. It's very correlated with the within designs that you can do in cognitive psychology, and very often you have to use between designs in social psychology, uh, because people are just aware of let's say, an ostracism manipulation. You cannot first say, I don't want to play with you, and then do everything again and say, I want to play with you, it's weird. Um, so I think that's an important issue. Power, getting high power in social psychology is much more difficult. Uh, I would predict that that's what's going on. I know that some cognitive psychologists, and I do cognitive research myself, sometimes feel a bit like, oh yeah, we're doing better, but I don't, uh, I'm not sure, sure yet. I think we all need to be a bit more modest than that. And I wouldn't worry too much about it, but the challenge for psychologists is really a little bit bigger. Because I, I suggested some easy fixes, like move to within designs if it's possible. But I think for social psychology, we'll, we will need more collaboration. I think that will be important. So you have a question, I have a question. We get together, we collect data, and some questions are for you, and some questions are for me. Uh, and then we have twice as many participants. And if we can get that going, then, and it's necessary. Uh, in, in, in physics, they had to build a large hadron collider. And now everybody is working there, 1,500 people. But of course, before that, you had Albert Einstein. He could do everything by himself. But that's not possible in physics anymore. And I think in social psychology, if we want to tackle really important questions, the effects might be small, but very important. It might be very difficult to collect a lot of data. I think we will have to work together more to get these questions answered. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you for your great talk. Uh, I have a quick question about uh, Sherpa and Romeo, where you can uh, upload your own articles for open access. How does it work out with the copyright agreement with the publisher? So this website has basically done all the difficult legal reading for you, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And uh, in the copyright agreement, so it turns out that even publishers are realizing that times are changing, uh, and it's very unlikely that if they keep a very strict copyright rule, that we will not get together and fix this problem ourselves. Sometimes it happens. There are some journals where everything was with a publisher, like Elsevier, and they say, well, we're doing most of the work ourselves. We're just going to pick up all our work, create a new journal with a new name, all the editors just transfer, and now it's open access. So a lot of journals are like, well, we don't want that. So let's give people something. 
And what they give us in the copyright agreement is actually the right to share uh, the word version of the document. And Sherpa Romeo just looks at all the copyright agreements and checks, is this allowed, is this allowed, is this not? And some journals will not allow you to share a preprint. They're rare. Even Elsevier, which is known as one of the least progressive publishers, even Elsevier will allow this because they publish Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Yeah. So they did all the difficult thinking, and if they have a checkbox that says green is good, please upload your paper. It will be a good decision. Thank you. Will your paper then show up on Google Scholar? App? Like, mm -hmm. does it link through there as well? You, so you have to upload it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, it will not. Yeah, you have to okay. submit it to some homepage. Yeah. yeah. So there are some. You have to host it. Uh, you can host it anywhere you want on your own site, even. But I would recommend things like ResearchGate or Academia.edu. There are some sites where you can share preprints. And uh, if you put it on uh, academia.edu or ResearchGate, um, then it will show up next to, uh, and, and you will become one of the easy clickable links. Yes. So I'm curious if they are in the Netherlands, right? They are in the Netherlands, and it's weird because the Dutch government has actually said that in 2020, all Dutch funded research should be available open access. Although, if that means that we will not publish with Elsevier, it will cost us a lot of tax money. <laughs> so, they will probably work something out. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. Here we have maybe five minutes or so. No, two minutes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, one just last question. Yeah. You guys okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.